Hi everyone, we're going to get started here. Uh, welcome to the second session of the AI and Real Life <laughs> Seminar Series. Um, we're thrilled to have Tony Jabbar from Netflix here tonight, so thank you, Tony. Um, just two quick announcements. One, if you're in the graduate student community, fantastic opportunity this afternoon. The, uh, the new group, uh, it's women in mathematics, statistics, and computational engineering called Whimsy. Uh, they are having their kickoff dinner tonight, 5 to 7 p.m. over in Gibbons Grove. It's by the Terman Fountain. And so anyone in the graduate community, you're welcome to attend. Um, it's a really great group uh, that's just starting up. Uh, second announcement, there were a few of you who were selected, um, and sorry it was just really limited this time, to go to dinner with Tony tonight. Um, if you're one of those lucky students, uh, hopefully you got the, uh, all the emails and you're all set. If you have any questions, Rebecca down here can answer them right afterwards. And if you weren't selected, um, there will be plenty of opportunities throughout the uh, quarter for other dinners like that. So stay tuned. This is just the first of many. So okay with that, I'd like to hand it over to Jean-Luc. Okay, thank you, Karen. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Thank you for, for coming to the second session uh, today. Uh, we do have, uh, um, I want to announce first the, the seminar, the next seminar is gonna be on Wednesday. Uh, we have Eric Horwitz from uh, Microsoft Research. Uh, joining us, so this is a special time for that seminar, so just make sure you can, you can join us as well this Wednesday. But let me introduce the speaker for today. We have uh, Tony Jabara here from, from Netflix, he's the director of Netflix. Um, uh, Tony is, uh, has a, a lot of experience in machine learning. He is, he is uh, on leave from uh, Columbia University <coughs> where he was uh, he founded and he's, uh, was running the machine learning, the Columbia machine learning uh, lab there. Um, his expertise is, is very broad. He is broad, brings in both the, the technical side of AI with a lot of work and, and research in algorithms and methods for, for uh, machine learning, but also the applied side. It started from, uh, from face recognition and, and uh, computer graphics, and obviously is now on, on Netflix, as you can see from the title, what he's interested in. Um, so, uh, again, broad experience, a lot of uh, uh, interesting uh, work and interesting ideas. Uh, I just want to finish this by citing one of his most uh, 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 popular uh, uh, articles in science where it starts by saying we live in a network and he goes on from that saying you know, a lot of things about our life and how that has changed, sort of seems sort of out of, uh, of the Matrix movie, uh, so I guess I'll leave it with that as uh, the topic will be sort of connected to, to movies and, and uh, content of our response. So again, Tony, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Gianluca, and thanks everyone for coming today. Great, thank you. Um, today I'm excited to tell you about a few things that we're doing at Netflix. Think of these as kind of three vignettes of systems that we're working on that seek to use AI and really machine learning to help improve the product for you know over 100 million uh, subscribers and how to make it more personalized so that you get recommendations and you get an experience that's really tailored for you. And so we have an expression on Netflix, we don't have one product, we have a hundred or hundreds of millions of products because each person gets a very different experience. Um, so let's go back 10,000 years ago to what really is I think the kind of root of storytelling which is caveman drawings and storytelling really is part of human behavior and it's been going for you know, uh, thousands of years strong. It's the way we share culture, we teach our children language, we kind of socialize and bond, and it's really kind of fundamentally what changes, uh, what distinguishes humans from animals. And storytelling, if you think about it, you know, I'm telling a story today, I'm using PowerPoint. Um, 10,000 years ago, people would be using, let's say, cave drawings. Um, but one key aspect of it is there's a two-way communication. So there's the person telling the story, but then there's the audience who's paying attention to that person, maybe laughing at a piece that's funny or tuning out to check email at something that's kind of not so interesting. It really is these two arrows of communication. And so that lets the storyteller realize what is good about that story, what's compelling, what, you know, what sub-audiences like that and what that part and what sub-audiences don't like some parts. And so we've changed storytelling uh, since then 
through the invention of the printing press. And so in 1440, Johannes Gutenberg says, we can take storytelling to the millions by printing the stories rather than having someone in an auditorium or a cave telling that story. And that scales things up dramatically. But one thing that's lost is we're missing that feedback blue arrow. The audience gets to read the story, but the person who's communicating that story and sharing that experience doesn't know what's resonating, what's not, and how to improve storytelling. Um, things got even bigger scale and went to the billions when we switched to TV in 1927. And now you know, we have billions of people throughout the world who are seeing stories. But again, it's one blue arrow. We don't really get to see that feedback loop of what is interesting about that story, what parts are people tuning out from, and what parts are, are they choosing. So at Netflix, and through the introduction, really, of streaming video on demand, everyone can watch whatever they want, whenever they want. And it's a kind of large-scale global channel of communication. But it's also another feedback arrow back, because now we can start seeing what each kind of account is interested in. What shows are they watching? What are they fast forwarding? What are they hovering over? You know, what are they giving thumbs up to and thumbs down to? So that kind of closes the feedback loop that we lost when we went to millions and billions as we scaled up. And now we can see how we can improve storytelling and really personalize the experience so that each person gets the best story and set of stories for them and even kind of uh, ways of explaining and communicating why that story should be of interest. And I'll get to that today. But we like to think of it as machine learning really gives us a unique product for each customer. And so now it's in 190 plus countries, over 100 million members. And we think of it as over 100 million personalized products, not just one product. Um, one of the goals of a lot of Netflix and machine learning is how do we improve the amount and engagement members have with the product, and how do we make them retain and stay happy with their subscription and keep giving us their valuable money at the end of the month saying, that was good, thank you, let's renew for another month. Um, and so machine learning really drives a lot of that personalization, which is essential to increase engagement and increase retention. We have a number of machine learning systems here that help build this personalized page for this user. Um, for example, we like to look at the thousands of movies and TV shows that we have you know, in your country or wherever you know, you're streaming and figure out which ones are the best ones for you. So how do we personalize that ranking and say, this is the number one movie or TV show for you, this is the number two one, and, and so on. So that's a, a problem we solve for each individual user and try to give the best ranking. Another thing we like to do is once we know that ranking, how do we present it to you on a page that looks sensible, where things are clustered and organized into rows, and so you can navigate and find what you're looking for? That also is a machine learning algorithm. Um, so how do you turn that ranking from one to, you know, uh, whatever thousands into some uh, kind of organized page like this? How do we promote things that are new to the service, we don't know much about, but we think should maybe resonate with some people and kind of start off some shows with trailers and billboards to get you to give it a try. And that's personalized promotion. Today I'll talk also about personalized image selection because one of the main problems we realize is when I give you a ranking and I say, here are the best movies for you, most people say, why? Why is this movie good for me? You have to explain the why behind the recommendations. And so we we modify the imagery behind the movies we present to you to kind of give you the, the connection or the gateway point for you. And I'll talk a little more about that later. Then there's other aspects. How do we do search better by learning collaborative search? How do we personalize messaging? And even how do we personalize what movies and TV shows we're going to acquire in the future so that we make sure no subpopulation is missing out and kind of feeling like there's nothing on Netflix for them. OK, so I'm not going to go through all the different techniques we use, but you know, here is kind of a quick set of textbooks we like to have handy on machine learning. Um, you know, several of these are classics. And we really are not committed to any one machine learning method or AI method. So you'll see a lot of buzzwords here from things like deep uh, neural networks or neural network learning to Bayesian nonparametrics 
matrix factorization, clustering, Gaussian processes, bandits. So again, we like to think of the entire plethora of machine learning, whatever can serve you know, the, the, the end user the best. Okay? Um, and similarly, platforms wise, you know, clearly there are some platforms that are really super scalable. How many folks have heard of Spark? Hopefully most of you. That's kind of a great platform for going to large scale distributed machine learning solutions. But a lot of these tools are, again, things that I would suggest you look into in, in you know, TensorFlow or uh, some other techniques in scikit-learn are used quite often. So what's happening is there's a little bit of a consolidation of a lot of the machine learning techniques within these software packages. And so a lot of these are kind of key, let's say, stepping stones into the exciting world of, of machine learning in practice and in industry. So I'll give a couple of vignettes. Let me start with one of how we actually rank the catalog for you. Um, again, because most people don't have time to really browse for the next movie. They've got 10 or 20 seconds after a long day at work when they sit down and they say, let me see what I can find to watch. That's a small window of time. You can only really consider you know, 20 or 30 options. And so figuring out what those 20 or 30 options that are best for you are out of thousands of possibilities, that's the goal of collaborative ranking. We're really trying to predict what you're going to want to watch. And here's um, where we were in 2006. We started this thing called the Netflix uh, Challenge. How many people remember this from 2006? So a few of you, this is kind of now you know, feeling a little prehistoric. Um, I don't think any of these movies and TV shows were around back then, but anyway. Um, what we had was people giving star ratings to the movies and TV shows they were watching on Netflix back then. We shared a data set and we said to people, can you try to predict held out star ratings for some users where we've hidden some combination of movies that they have, they have seen or, and they have rated, but we won't tell you that combination. Use what you have available in terms of other stars to predict held out stars. And so this was a, a great challenge. Um, one of the problems with this is it's very aspirational. Um, stars are kind of a, aren't really capturing human behavior, really. It's people communicating kind of what they think we want to know rather than what they really care about. So everyone gives Citizen Kane five stars, but nobody really wants to watch Citizen Kane. <laughs> um, but you know, this was a great, exciting challenge. And one of the techniques that it really led to was this idea of matrix factorization. So if you go back, this matrix of users cross movies, where each element in that matrix is a number, like three stars, five stars, and so on, you could think of that's a big matrix. Um, and one technique that really kind of was spurred by this challenge was this idea of taking that big matrix of ratings R and figuring out how to rewrite it as a product of two skinny matrices, U and M. <laughs> And if you could do that well, actually, that would help improve your performance on the Netflix challenge. And so this kind of really grew and blossomed as an area of machine learning and other types of kind of applied mathematics. Um, it also led to kind of probabilistic versions of matrix factorization where techniques like multinomial topic models were basically going after the same problem, but rather than thinking of it as a kind of linear algebra decomposition of a matrix, you could think of how do I represent you know, this matrix as probability distributions where there's a probability of watching every single movie. And that's kind of a, a, uh, a non-negative type of factorization if you think about it that way. Um, and then we moved away from star ratings. Like I told you, that's too aspirational. And now what we really look at is how people are actually consuming the content. And the matrix really is, did this user watch Stranger Things, yes or no? And you can imagine this is a big binary matrix really at this point. And one of the users can be represented as a long binary string of things they watched, things they didn't watch. And it turns out watching is much more realistic a data source than giving things stars. Um, it takes two hours to watch something. It takes a second to give it a star. and that. In that one second, people might not be really capturing what they really feel. And so this is, we think, a much better uh, representation of 
you know, what's, what's really valuable to the user. And we've moved away from linear decompositions and now looking at nonlinear decompositions. So instead of taking this matrix and breaking it up into two using linear algebra, you can say, how do we take your viewing history over here on the left and try to reconstruct it with a lower dimensional code that's maybe 50 or 100 dimensional from the thousands and thousands of dimensions on the left hand side and then you can reconstruct back x hat from only that code. This is a technique called an autoencoder that's coming from deep learning and, and neural network learning and each layer is kind of a linear operation just like the matrix factorization we saw earlier but then it gets squashed through these kind of vertical bars that give it a nonlinearity, and then we do another squashing kind of think of it as slowly shrinking the dimensionality of your big matrix rather than just saying it's a product of these two skinny matrices right away and bringing it down to 50 or 100 dimensions right away and then we slowly grow it back up and say can we reconstruct your view history so this is a neural network approach and it captures nonlinear relationships between the, the viewing patterns as opposed to just linear relationships like we had a couple of slides ago and we we're basically trying to reconstruct your view history using just 50 numbers reconstruct the kind of tens of thousands of play not play decisions you made um, things get more interesting when you make this probabilistic this leads to a technique called a variational autoencoder and so that's nonlinear and probabilistic. So I, I mentioned before we had linear, then we made it probabilistic, then we said let's make it nonlinear with neural networks. And actually, you want to keep going and make it nonlinear and probabilistic, where you're trying to reconstruct not really your your view history on the left hand side, but kind of a probability distribution over your reconstructed view history. And the idea there is you really want to be able to not just reconstruct things perfectly, but put probability distributions, because there's many possible ways that this kind of view history could be reconstructed. And what we're really trying to do is predict where your view history is going to go. And there's many possible paths of where you could go from where you've kind of come from so far. So here's all the movies I've watched so far. It's not like I'm going to go watch this for sure and then that next. There's a distribution over all the possible things that could fan out from where I am today. So it's in, important to think of this as a probabilistic distribution. And we've also made it a little bit better by, uh, sorry, wrong way. By making it a multinomial distribution, which then also says, really think of it as there's a distribution for every single movie and TV show and they all have to sum to one and they're never going to be negative. And so that was kind of another insight. So we're trying to reconstruct what you've done, turn it into a probability that's kind of similar to what it's summarizing in the past, using very few dimensions in the middle, and going through some nonlinearities. And it turns out this is, in many ways, a better way of summarizing how someone's consumed content and predicting what content they're going to go for next. And um, this is kind of evaluated on some benchmark data sets. So here's that classic old Netflix data set from 2006. This is uh, another data set um, called the Movie Lens 20 million data set. And in the kind of heavy font is this multinomial VAE technique. And it's getting a better score. Um, you know, across the board compared to the classical neural networks and compared to kind of linear factorization or matrix fa factorization, this WMF technique. So, again, being nonlinear and being probabilistic has kind of helped us capture some nuances in viewing histories and predicting them better going forward. Um, here we're showing things like how good the recall is, but think of it as these are metrics of how good a ranking is. So if you played something that is at the very top of my ranking next, I should get a big score. So if I ranked, let's say, Stranger Things in position one, and then House of Cards in position two, and then uh, Narcos in position three, and you played, let's say, Narcos, you'll make 33 cents on that prediction. It's because it's one over three. If you play the top thing, then you make a dollar. And so the idea is to get a ranking where you really predict the next play at the very top. 
Okay, so some of these metrics capture that uh, behavior. Okay, so then here's another interesting lesson that we came across around not just predicting what the user is going to do next, but figuring out, well, if I intervene based off of machine learning, what's going to happen? So this is one of these things that no one tells you in machine learning, but we all know it to be true. When we work with machine learning, we're trying to learn how to make great predictors. But no one wants to stop there. We build machine learning models because we want to take actions in the real world. Okay, that's what is exciting. We learn from data so that we can make self-driving cars that actually have to interact in the real world. We make recommendation engines that don't just predict what you're going to do next, but try to influence it and take actions and recommend what you're going to watch next. And so there is this causal learning part, which is kind of ignored in a lot of machine learning and AI these days. Most of it is predictive. We don't want to just make predictions. We want to learn how to use those predictions in order to take actions and interventions in the world that will work. So for instance, if I, go out, if I look outside when it's raining, there's a lot of people walking around with umbrellas. But that doesn't mean if I told everyone, keep your umbrellas at home, it's going to stop raining, right? There's a correlation between rain and umbrellas. And machine learning models are great at finding these correlations. But we all know that there's causal relationships that actually matter. And it's not just about learning good correlations like this. And so here's an example, um, just to motivate. This is kind of a time series of the price of various, uh, let's say, airline tickets over time and the number of flights that are being booked at various times in the year. And so you see kind of a spurt when it's around the holidays for 2015, 2016, 2017. And if you plotted the distribution of price to um, number of flights being booked or sales, you would learn this nice correlation that when more people buy more flights, flights are more expensive. And if you draw this arrow, uh, this line, and a machine learning model figures this out, it's natural then to, for the machine learning model to suggest you want to increase profit, increase price, you're just going to see more flights being bought, and you're just going to make amazing amounts of money. And we all know this is not true, and it's because there is a kind of reverse, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's no causal relationship here. There's some hidden confounder, or sometimes there's kind of an anti-causal relationship. Um, so what's really happening? Machine learning is great at taking inputs and predicting outputs. You know, your input might be X, might be your view history, the output is what you're going to play next. Or your input might be, you know, an image, the output might be the label of that image. But in the real world, there's a lot of hidden confounders that are variables you just didn't measure. And it's not about just getting x uh, to predict y as accurately as possible. So there may be some other hidden confounder, like there's some holidays happening. And that's the real cause of the flight demand going up. And that's the real cause of the prices going up, because people have to see their relatives on, on the holidays. Or there may be conferences. You know, so it's not something that you knew about, but there may have been a major conference happening in San Francisco that weekend, and everyone has to attend that big conference, and prices shoot up, and demand shoots up. Shoots up. And so if you just learn y equals f of x, no matter how good that f function is through machine learning, you're not going to be actually solving the real problem. So we realized that you know, without knowing all the possible hidden confounders, you're going to get the wrong answer. And one of the things we've realized is this happens a lot with our messaging. And so Messaging is an intervention we do. We email people, here's some new titles you should watch. They just got added to the service. Or we send you kind of a pop-up on your apps, an in-app type of notification or a push notification. Or, you know, you should watch this tonight. It's a, you know, a new series we think you'd like. So it turns out we have, let's say, algorithms that are already in place, which are sending messages and deciding which channels and what to tell you about. And we can, as a machine learning team, go and study what's currently happening. Look at what messages have been sent and what behavior did they elicit. And if you're not careful, though, this causality problem will come back and hurt you. And the reason is there is a hidden confounder. 
it turns out when you send more messages, it looks like people watch more. But the reason really is people are just more active on the internet at both those times. So people are more likely to open their emails and pay attention to your messages because it's, nine to f it's not 9 to 5, but it's a 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. And they'll look at their email or pay attention to that pop-up. But that's also the time when they're going to actually watch anyway. So the message didn't cause the watching. What caused the watching was it's the afternoon, I'm done with work, and it's not bedtime, it's not midnight. So it's causing the watching and causing the actual email reading. It's not that the email reading is causing the watching or that the watching is causing the email reading. There's this other hidden confounder, which is the time of day. And so how do we fix that with machine learning and kind of AI techniques? It turns out there's this approach which really comes back to econometrics around instrumental variables. This is a, a variable z that we add, which is kind of a random variable that kind of perturbs things. So we continue to send messages to, let's say, the users, and we, watch, we see how much they watch. And there's some hidden confounders we don't know about. But what we might do is we'll just hold away, pull away some messages randomly. Z might be kind of a censor this message right now type of randomization. Or send double the messages right now type of randomization. So if you keep track of your randomization, you're actually going to be able to tease about the causal effect with machine learning. And the technique that we're looking into is this technique called two-stage least squares, which actually tries to do two stages of machine learning. The first stage tries to learn how to predict x from the synthetic perturbation. So predict x from z. And then the second stage is learn to predict y from the predicted x, not from the logged x. Okay, so that's really the idea. It's pretty simple. You just have to do two stages of machine learning. And what this, uh, what this does is it'll help isolate the causal effect of x on y. And this was actually something related to what econometrics researchers did um, to figure out, do cigarettes cause cancer? Or is it that you know, your predisposition to, have, to getting cancer makes you crave cigarettes? We don't know the causal relationship. Cigarette companies argued it's impossible to ever figure out. But we had instrumental variables, which were kind of randomized taxes that different states placed on cigarette smoking. And if you think of that as a randomization, it pushes cigarette smoking up and down because of taxation. You could say which, which, which variable was the cause of the other. And so similarly, we can do that with machine learning by doing this two-stage predict x from z, and then from predicted x, predict y. And so here's kind of a simple summary of what we fixed. Initially, we looked at how much sending an email, sending a push notification, or sending an in-app notification increased viewing. And it, we got really odd results. So it looked like email was decreasing viewing. Push notifications were decreasing viewing. And in-app notifications were increasing viewing. So when we study the X and Y data, that's what the machine learning models were telling us. And they were telling us nonsensical things, right? The business partners will ask you, well, that doesn't make any sense. I want to know what's better, email, push, or in-app for getting people to watch more. And you're telling me some of them are actually negative? Immediately, you lose a lot of credibility as a machine learning researcher. Um, but then if you do this two-stage least squares technique, it actually gives you the real coefficients. And it tells you that actually push notifications have the strongest effect and it's significant. And they're all positive. And that's because we removed the fact that x and y were being confounded by this time of day variable and some other hidden confounders. OK, and here's another vignette on kind of once you've figured out what you want to do as a prediction, once you've figured out perhaps some causal models as well, convincing the user that you, you know, they should listen to you. OK, and so that's one of the main problems we have. Why are you recommending this to me? When I see my page, there's all this stuff on it. Why should I pay attention? And so it turns out this involved an interesting foray into online learning. So batch machine learning is what really most companies do these days. You collect a bunch of data. You've got billions of hypotheses of how the data interact and how they can co-predict each other. 
which hypothesis is correct. Out of those billions of hypotheses, you want to find that one light bulb and say, this is the relationship, this is the function, this is the model. Okay, so that's, and we want to find that computationally efficiently and statistically efficiently. Here's one if interesting problem you face if you're doing machine learning at scale at a place like Netflix. You've got many users, you collect data on them, that takes months, you learn the model, that takes months, you build a system that should do what this model suggests, that also takes months, then you run this thing called an A-B test. Let's say half the users get the usual experience, the control experience, and the other half get this new experience. And then you see what's better. Is A better or B better? That's A-B testing, and we see, oh, let's say B is better. Then we roll out B, and everyone now has this new experience. That's kind of how innovation happens at all the big companies, from Facebook to Google to Netflix as well. Um, but one of the main problems with this approach of waiting to collect a whole bunch of data, figuring out the model, and then running an A-B test, is it creates a lot of regret. Because for the past 12 months or so, you were giving all these users and half of these users a bad experience when you could have been doing a better experience. Because you wanted to get that perfect model, that one single ideal model that fits your data really well. So it turns out there's a smarter way of doing this called online learning. And another uh, kind of version of it is called Thompson sampling. The idea is you have a whole bunch of models, you don't know which one's best randomly sample from those models. And as you learn, you kind of say, oh, these models weren't as good as these other others, and you start suppressing them. And you slowly suppress the bad light bulbs until you're left with the good light bulb at the very end. And so, you know, you're trying to minimize the regret or, the, or maximize the reward <coughs> while you're doing this. And it turns out if you have a smart algorithm like Thompson sampling, where you say, I have a distribution over models, and I'm going to act kind of assuming my, mo my distribution of models is good, I'm going to act on that by taking the best possible action from one random recommended model. You see how much reward you get. Then you update your distribution over models, given that single kind of action and reward that you've taken. And then you slowly kind of go from this uniform distribution to something that finally converges onto the best model. But the whole time, you're actually getting less regret on all these users because you're slowly evolving your system rather than waiting for all the data to be there, getting the best model, and then releasing it. And so that's how we select images for all our shows. Um, we first kind of uniformly sample the images, and then eventually we start figuring out that this was the best image for the Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt TV show. Okay, and that's through this technique called Thompson sampling and, and multi-arm bandits. Uh, that's why I have that picture of those casinos. Um, then we went a step further and said, well, it turns out, so in addition to finding the single, did I skip one of those? Oh, no, here we go. In addition to finding the single best image, can we find the best image for that show for you? So this now becomes a contextual bandit, where the best action and the best model depends on the context, which is that user the things they've watched and how they've kind of behaved and what country they're from and you know, how long they've been on the service. And so we noticed that we can predict the best winning image by looking at your view history, for instance, and saying, oh, okay, this person watches a lot of romance. Serendipity, eternal sunshine, uh, while you were sleeping. So if I want to show them a picture for Goodwill Hunting, I should show that picture for Goodwill Hunting. This person, that's their kind of explanation for why they should care when I say your number one choice is Goodwill Hunting. It's because you like this stuff and here's a piece of this movie which contains this stuff. And then similarly for somebody who watches a lot of comedies, here's a reason you might want to watch Goodwill Hunting. You know, Robin Williams is a famous comedian. And so this is the why behind the recommendation. And it's being done with online learning and over time figures out for the right person, here's the better image. Here's a user who likes to watch Uma Thurman movies. So for Pulp Fiction, we should show him this picture of Uma Thurman uh, in the movie. A person who watches a lot of John Travolta movies, here's the better picture for them for Pulp Fiction. So this is giving you the why behind the machine learning, not just the what, not just the ranking. And it turns out this increased our accuracy over 
random, let's say, uh, image choice or curated image choice even when we asked Hollywood people what do you think is the best image for this movie or this TV show. The yellow is the kind of per country online bandit and then these two others are contextual bandits that actually change the best image for that movie or that TV show for you. And here's a video. So what's interesting is it doesn't look at the pixels of that image and figures out, oh, it's somebody's falling off a chair and that's kind of comedic. It just realizes that the people who watched a lot of comedy actually gave that show a chance if we showed that picture for it. So it's getting at kind of the computer vision aspect through machine learning, not through pixel analysis. Um, I'm going to skip the reliable machine learning stuff because that's kind of more engineering, um, but there's a lot of piping under the hood that goes into making these systems reliable so that they don't fail or when, they fit, when, when and if they do, they back up to simpler, more reliable machine learning systems. So that's kind of an interesting lesson learned that, yes, there's some really great machine learning out there, but the most complicated models, they're the ones with the most bugs. And so you might want to have kind of a machine learning 101 model as a backup plan when your better models fail. And you know, we do a lot of uh, graceful degradation. I'll skip through this, um, but you know, again, monitoring all our systems and gracefully degrading them and retraining all of them daily is kind of part and parcel of machine learning, which is really becoming now also an engineering field because of the large scale components. And um, let me instead spend some time talking a little bit about um, some ethical aspects of data science and machine learning and some of the things we struggle with at Netflix because we are working with, again, sensitive data on a sensitive problem. So one of the things we really have to always focus on is how do we do fair A-B testing? So A-B testing is really the way a lot of companies, including us, do innovation and improve the value we give to our customers. We will split the population and try something new on some users and see if they like it better, if they engage better, if they retain better, and so on. But it turns out if you don't have some rules around how you do A-B testing, you can quickly get into unfair situations. So here are the types of things we like to first A-B test. It turns out it matters when you go into an A-B test that you have a strong hypothesis a priori that you're actually going to do something good for the customer. You don't just A-B test things and say, oh, let's just randomly change this up, see what happens. You know, that's really unfair to our contract with customers who are paying us. We really say, let's try to see new treatments and use new kind of product variations to improve the service for them. That's part of our agreement. Um, we also will sometimes think something's going to be neutral on customers but has some other benefit. For example, it makes the engineering systems more reliable or reduces cost or reduces other types of friction. We also allow users to opt out and say, I don't want to be tested on. I just want the vanilla Netflix. Don't try kind of giving me new things that might be better. Um, we also don't like to do A-B tests if we hypothesize that it's actually going to degrade the experience, even if we think we're going to learn from it and maybe one day invent something much better. Okay, so this is kind of part of data science ethics because you can fall down some slippery slopes. If you say, oh, don't worry, we're going to do this, it's going to be very harmful, the user is not going to like it, but we might invent something really cool, that's, that's also a slippery slope. Um, and also, we try to avoid trying to use A-B testing to find kind of ways of limiting harm on users in order to achieve some necessary change. And then finally, we completely avoid kind of A-B testing out of intellectual curiosity. You know, let's see what happens if we just messed with the pages on some users. That's really not the right way to go about it. 
And another important aspect is we should not degrade one group in order to benefit another. So this is kind of fairness because you can say, okay, we can show some people some, you know, really complicated pages, get them to browse around a lot and find good content. And then we when they find the treasure troves in our catalog, then we'll present that great set of movies and TV shows to some other group. So we don't want to do that. That would be unfair. That would be making some users struggle a lot more than others to find something good to watch and then others, other users would benefit. So we don't want to have this kind of mismatch where some users get better treatment and some users get worse. So you have to be fair and kind of equal opportunity in your A-B testing. Another thing we've quickly learned is data does not equal truth. And so now we've got a lot of data as a society. We think it's going to be perfect, but it turns out you know, we're actually finding patterns that are not necessarily the causal patterns. And it's because the data itself was created by society, and society itself has biases. Um, algorithms will lock onto patterns sometimes, like the example I showed you with messaging and with the umbrella and the rain that are not causal. So, oh, there's a relationship between these data points and these data points, but it turns out that's not the cause and effect relationship. And you don't want to go in and action on that because it would somehow be unfair. And so there's things like presentation bias, selection bias, survey bias. But here's a, an example that I like. This is a title called Beyond the Lights. And our recommendation engine looks at who watched this title and what else did they watch in order to recommend more things like Beyond the Lights. And it turns out if you go through this kind of co-viewing style recommendation engine, it recommends all these movies if you watch Beyond the Lights. And if you look at all those movies, they're all kind of African-American movies. And it turns out it's because of some correlation in the data, but it, those movies aren't really about the storyline behind, behind Beyond the Lights. It's more of a kind of Notting Hill style kind of, you know, uh, romance between, you know, uh, I forget the, the characters, but they happen to be African-American. And that is the story. So if I'm going to be recommended something based off of having watched Beyond the Lights, it should be something that's got a similar story, not just a similar kind of demographic, for instance. And so you don't want to just trust the relationships in the data 100%. Sometimes they're based off of some other, let's say, causes that aren't really related to content selection, but more just kind of a, a co-occurrence in the data. And we're also looking at techniques that will help us tease apart some of these biases in the data. And one of them is called the Bayesian truth theorem. And it'll help answer questions like this. So if I ask this audience, what is the capital of Illinois? So since we're in the US, most of you say Springfield. But if you collected data across the world, you would get a lot of people saying Chicago. And you get some people maybe saying Aurora. Um, which is, you know, potentially, uh, I haven't run this survey, but I'm pretty sure Chicago would be the winning answer if you just did a web survey that worked worldwide and everyone could just click on it because that's the most recognized answer. And so how do you avoid kind of popularity becoming the source of truth? And how do you tease apart really what's the truth in the data beyond kind of this simple count all the answers and that's the, the best possible action to take? So there's techniques by Dan Prelick and others around this um, that we're looking into as well. But again, to summarize, um, machine learning has great opportunity to be a great platform to personalize a product for all individual users to make great recommendations. And there's some core lessons to learn around how to make sure you're learning causal relationships, how you're kind of building your machine learning online so you don't kind of wait for the data to all be there. How do you make reliable machine learning systems that are engineered to kind of degrade safely and, and reliably if they have to and fall back to reasonable models when they don't work? And also how to make machine learning more ethical from a data science ethics perspective. And one last plug is to look at research.netflix.com. And we've got some great positions there on the data scientist front for uh, PhDs and, and other graduate students. Thanks. Tony, we have time for, for a few questions. So, uh, Netflix, is there a type of data set that you really crave for? 
to get from the users, but you cannot ask because of particular reason? Um, so, yeah, it's an interesting question. Is there a data set? Tony, do you mind uh, repeating yeah. the questions for, so that... Sure. Is there a data set we'd love to have at Netflix um, that would be impossible to get? Uh, I mean, we can, uh, there's lots of these types of data sets. We could, we'd love to know why you, know, you didn't enjoy that show or why did you stop watching right now? Um, is it because you didn't like it or because you know, dinner was ready and it's time to go grab a bite? And so you know, there's you know, infinite amounts of things you'd like to get from the user. More data, more feedback, but every one of those kind of data points has a cost where you're taking away time from that user and limiting their appreciation of your product. And so we've realized that you want to minimize friction, minimize the amount of delay and the amount of extra steps the user has to do to get to what they want, but then try to learn from that minimal interaction the most you can for your machine learning models. Uh, yeah, question over here. Um, how many hashtags or tags for a single movie you have in general, and how do you create them, other than just the user viewing pattern? So, interesting question, how many tags do we have for a movie, and I, I guess other types of descriptors, mm -hmm. in addition to what our users are, are doing and viewing? That's a great question. We've got lots of people at Netflix who add an additional layer of metadata to our movies and our TV shows with things like what genre and what happens, who's starring in that movie. And our algorithms definitely use that information. But this is a very laborious process. You can think of it as you know, a bunch of experts who really understand you know, the industry from a creative perspective, sitting there annotating with all these, all these possible tags. It's a, it, it's a kind of a business cost for us, but we, we have a lot of manual annotation and human labeling. It's not just all unsupervised. Yeah. Oh. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, sorry, you go. Do you find any differences in the algorithms that you use because of subscription as opposed to YouTube for advertising? So, great question. We're a subscription service. We're not an advertising service. So we really try to have algorithms that maximize, let's say, long-term value. Um, we're not going after the, the quick clickbait types of things where you, know, you can make that penny or fractions of a penny just when someone clicks and goes to a page. And so we really have to think about not just getting you to click on that movie, which is sometimes easy. You can just you know, make the movie blink and be really bright. And people will click on the brighter stuff than the darker stuff just because it's easier to, to hover and click on it. And that's, that's clickbait. We're really looking at how do we measure kind of a long-term value from the users. So not just did they spend an hour or two watching, but did they somehow you know, really enjoy it, and are they going to retain next month and month after month versus just there was some eye candy there or something salacious and they just clicked on it because of that. So we have, let's say, a much longer term as a subscription service kind of value uh, functions that we're trying to estimate for our users. Monthly instead of, let's say, by the seconds. Yeah. What's your sample size for A-B testing? Uh, that's a good question. The sample size for A-B testing really depends on the effect you're trying to you know, create. If you do something that's really radical, um, it's affecting the service in every aspect of the page, you can have a smaller size A-B test. If it's something that's subtle in like, a, you know, how, how do you change the continue watching row and that only appears kind of sometimes on some people's pages, you really need kind of millions sometimes. So it, it, it will vary, but it can go up to the millions for different, uh, for different cells in an A-B test, for instance. Lots of questions. There was a question up there. Um, hi. Uh, going back to the image selection uh, part, um, I'm interested to know how do you get these uh, thumbnails uh, and do you ever use uh, like your machine learning to influence creating new thumbnails for movies? How do you make sure that it's true to the actual content? So that's a great question. Uh, a lot of our thumbnails are you know, built by creative teams, which will create the thumbnails, make sure that they look right, are not blurry, and they're you know, high quality thumbnails. We're also doing high quality kind of billboards, which are much larger as well, and using similar personalization on the billboards, and even kind of trailers as well. But we're moving to a situation now where we'll find, using computer vision, automatically good candidate thumbnails from the actual video. Um, but that's, 
you know, there, there's many more caveats there. You know, you need a computer vision system that figures out this is a good shot. It also has to follow some rules. You know, you can't show certain types of things. And so that's, uh, yeah, but that's definitely a, a great research project and we're working on it actually. Thanks. Uh, well, you're keeping track. I, I, maybe a couple more, yeah. yeah. So yeah, there was the recent GDPR uh, from Europe that was, I think, launched in May or so, um, which affects how big companies handle their data. Of course, we're conscious of that, and we follow the regulations there. I would say, you know, we were fortunate that we weren't, let's say, doing as many ornate things with the data, we're really just collecting the data for internal uses to improve the service to our customers. So that really you know, doesn't hit into many of the issues that the GDPR spells out. But there are a few things we had to adapt, and we did. But I think we had, let's say, 1% of the work ahead of us that other companies had to do there. Yeah. But I don't know exactly 1%. I don't know how much they have to work on it. But it looked like a lot of work for some folks. <laughs> How do you lead a big team of data scientists at a company like Netflix? What are the challenges? Um, so it's, uh, what are the challenges of leading a big team on uh, data science at Netflix? There are challenges because you have to really, it's a cross-functional role. You have to work with people on the product side. You have to work with people on the creative side, people on the engineering side, on the A-B testing side. Even data engineers, which is kind of a new kind of team, which is really in charge of collecting the data, storing it, logging it, providing it as reliable feeds. So I think you have to understand that you're part of an ecosystem. And if you look at, there's a great paper from last year on technical debt in machine learning, where they show you that you know, there might be a really beautiful machine learning algorithm inside this nugget, which would be the subject of a beautiful machine learning paper or AI paper. But it's going to be surrounded by all these other systems that will kind of monitor it, feed it with the data, and do all sorts of other work and the technical debt around that, and also all the other partnerships you have to have in order to get this kind of interesting machine learning idea you know, into the real world, that is huge. And you have to keep in mind, it's not just, oh, here's my code, take it and run. It's not quite that easy. OK, maybe one last one. Oh, you want to ask a question? Yeah. Um, um, I'm actually interested in the data that you put through. Um, so, we talk a lot about biases, but one thing that is pretty common in Netflix, for example, is people share accounts, right? So you can have one person sitting on account with like five different states. Then you guys still have the technical anomalies. Is your approach you think to clean data up and then pass the algorithms, or are you trying to look algorithms that are sort of like robust to anomalies? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, we do see some biases in our data because there's some things happening under the hood like account sharing that will skew the data sometimes. Um, but it's important, I think, to not try to perfectly clean the data, but rather to have, like you said, algorithms that are robust to it and algorithms that are aware that there could be kind of hidden effects, confounders, switching profiles, and people that are kind of watching with some mixture of, of behaviors. So it's important to not think of it as here's the best ranking, but there may be actually a distribution of things under, under the hood. So that's why probabilistic techniques can be helpful. Also, we're very aware of this production bias problem, which we always work towards, which is, did you watch something because we recommended it to you or because you really wanted to see it in the first place? So there's this chicken and egg aspect as well that we also have to work on. So there's many causes for someone watching something. It could be because it was them or someone who kind of came over and used Netflix that day as a visitor or some account sharing, or because it was over-promoted and we just you know, put it too, too prominently on the page. So we have to have algorithms that are robust to all of these sources of, of variation. OK, maybe one, I'll, I'll take the last question, actually. Uh, sure. Are, are we going to have another Netflix prize? Or? <laughs> oh, very good question. Are we going to have another Netflix prize? Um, I think at the end, it's, uh, you know, it's hard to share the data. One thing I can imagine in the future is you know, the data may not be what's getting shared, but the algorithms are easier to share. Sure. And so it, I can, I, in an ideal world, people would say, OK, here's my algorithm. I'm going to put it on GitHub. You know, people can try it out and get back to you and give you feedback and say, oh, we tried this out or it was published. 
So I actually like that model better. Yeah, um, and if you think about it, it's much more compact to share a piece of code. Absolutely. And you know, there's, there's other, obviously, issues around every kind of sharing, but sharing terabytes of data versus sharing you know, kilobytes of code, I think the, it makes more sense to go one way versus the other, let's say. OK, well, let's thank Tony again. Thank you. Thank you.